Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. Please share this video right now on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. This is episode number 123. That's right, episode 123. And that means we've been on lockdown in New York for 123 straight days. And I've had 123 conversations with fabulous speakers. Let's tell you a little bit about the show. If you haven't been here before, we discuss three crises, health, economy, and racial inequality. We're always looking for guests and theme suggestions. So please share and tell us your ideas. Sri at Sri.net is my email address. Tonight, we have a very special show. It's Sunday night, which means positivity. And today, it's positivity with Josh Friedman. On Sunday nights, we try to be positive despite every rotten thing going on. We meet generally positive, purposeful people who can help us get ready for the week. We might cry together, laugh together, mourn together, get angry together. We'll definitely learn together. And that's why we're here tonight. Please share this with your friends and family around the world. You're about to meet Professor Josh Friedman, Vice Chair at the Cary Institute for Global Good. Is there anything more positive than that? He's also a Pulitzer Prize winner for international reporting. He's a former Columbia J School professor. In fact, he was my J School professor and he's former chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists, one of the most important organizations in all of journalism. And you'll meet him in a couple of minutes. So please stand by to meet Josh. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri, and it is my honor to convene this daily conversation with people around the world. We've learned so much. We've shared so much in 123 days. Today, there was a milestone in New York for the first time since the first death in New York State on March 11. There were no deaths recorded on July 11. Unfortunately, Florida hit an all-time high on, in new cases, higher than California or New York in April. That tells you we're far from finished with this crisis, and we have so much to worry about and so much to think about. Let me tell you a little more about this show. In the first 100 episodes, we had 201 guests from 45 cities and 12 countries. 124 of them were women. We did that on purpose so that we can give voices and give opportunities to voices that you may not always hear. We've had 30 plus doctors and nurses, 20 authors, 10 CEOs, 15 teachers and professors. We want to continue to do this show and get your help. Please give us your suggestions, Sri at Sri.net. We also want to thank our producers, Rose Horowitz, at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon at Vandana underscore Menon. Please follow them. And this is all possible because of our partnership with scroll.in, one of India's leading news and information and culture websites. Please find our archives all 123 days on youtube.com slash Srinet, youtube.com slash Srinet. And before we bring on Professor Friedman, we have to thank our sponsors. We want to thank the Rutgers Global Entrepreneurship Program that has been running uh, ads here for the last couple of weeks. The show starts tomorrow. It's a virtual team camp. It starts tomorrow. And we wish everybody the best in that team camp, a virtual team camp, globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org. We also want to thank our friends at Muckrack for giving me the resources to run this show. Fundamentals of social media for journalists, PR pros, and everyone. This is a free certification course available to anybody. mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. Please share this with your friends. Take a photo, take a screenshot, and share it. It's about two hours of content, and you can do it in two hours, two days, two months and you get a free certificate, and 4,000 plus people have already signed up, and many of them are already sharing their certificates. So please share that with us. 
We also want to tell you about a couple of shows that we're producing on my team, DigiMentors, which is the company that does social, digital, and virtual events consulting. So we want to tell you about a couple of programs that are happening and will happen in the next few days. First, we want to remind you that on Sundays, we host here Sri's Sunday New York Times read along where we read the New York Times like crazy people live on Facebook for more than five years now. And today we had a fabulous guest, Mary C. Curtis, award-winning former journalist at the New York Times. And she's at CQ Roll Call. She's a journalist, trainer, and speaker. So that was at 8.30 to 10. Every Sunday we read aloud the New York Times. Please join us for that. We also want to tell you about a great show that we produce called The News Project. And this is hosted by Meryl Brown and Le Alex Leo. These, this is a weekly conversation with media industry experts and innovators brought uh, about the future of news brought to you by The News Project. And you can find this show on thenewsproject.net and you can find it there. Next episode is coming up with the CEO of WNYC, Goli, uh, Goli uh, Sheikoslaw Salami, is, sorry, Goli Sheikoslaw Salami is our guest. I'm so sorry to not, I didn't look at the name before I said it, my fault, I didn't work on it, that's on me. Thank you all for being here and please check out the show. They had Brian Stelter last week. It was really, it's a really great show. We're really excited to produce this with Meryl and Alex. And finally, we want to tell you about L Little Steven's Roadshow. This is a show that Stevie Van Zant and guests in a dynamic exchange to support Teach Rock's free curriculum. Just go to teachrock.org slash roadshow. And that's this Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Guests include Kanya Das, Kid Leo, Michael Stanley, and Neil Giraldo. Neil Giraldo, many of you will know, is longtime collaborator of Chrissy Hind, and he wrote, among other songs, Jesse's Girl, one of my favorite songs. So check that out. Go to teachrock.org slash roadshow. And now we're about to bring on Josh Friedman. And we want to thank Josh for being here. Our episode is about positivity. So tonight you're going to meet Professor Friedman. Last Sunday, every Sunday we do this, last Sunday we met the Krybics, Dr. Arthi Krybik and Dr. Tom Krybik. Tom is a neurologist and Dr. Arthi was running for Congress. Tuesday was her primary election. She lost to a incumbent in the Democratic primary who voted with Donald Trump 200 times and had the most consistent voting record with Donald Trump. That tells you something about the power of incumbency in American politics. And before that, the previous Sunday, we were with Will Sutton, who is a New Orleans-based columnist at The Advocate, NOLA News, and past president of the National Association of Black Journalists. But tonight, you're going to meet Josh Friedman, and here he is. Say hello, everyone, to Josh. Hi, Josh. Hello. Hi, Shri. How nice are to you? See you again. Nice to see you. How are you? I'm here in the wilds of upstate New York. Uh, I'm great, actually. I'm completely isolated with my wife, my daughter, and her two daughters live down the road, just walk away. And we've decided to allow us to be in touch with them, which is fabulous. They're six and four. And I walk around in the woods a lot. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that's about it, really, because we're stuck. <laughs> you, you, you are stuck. You, we should say that because you're in a rural area of upstate New York, the Wi-Fi isn't necessarily as good as you would like. So video may be a little, but the audio is, is great and that's what matters Good. really. We want to hear you. Good. So let's, let's, let's start by telling us how the pandemic has been. Uh, where were you when you realized that this is going to be a lockdown for the long haul? You're someone who's very familiar with international affairs. You travel a lot, you're on the road. Talk about that a, a little bit first, please. Actually, when I read about it happening in China and uh, January, I guess, uh, I kind of panicked because uh, it seemed like if it was going to happen in China, it was going to happen here. So I was an early panicker. And uh, 
<clears throat> everything unfortunately came to fruition. And uh, we were then, we have a program at the Cary Institute called the Logan Nonfiction Program. And uh, we had to close it down. You know, we have about a dozen or so writers and documentarians and residents. We had to close it down early. And uh, I was one of the hawks arguing that, that we should close it down quickly. And uh, unfortunately, it's still closed down. So that's where I was. I was here. The Institute is only a couple of miles away. And in this little village where we live, it's called Rensselaerville. And how did you know that when you saw it in China that it was going to come here or was going to be as bad as you suspected it was going to be? I think it's based on having been a journalist for a long time. You know, I kind of put two and two together. And uh, knowing the uh, leadership of the United States at the moment, didn't seem to me that we were going to be particularly skilled in dealing with it. And uh, it just made sense based on SARS and MERS and all the other past uh, viruses that uh, it was just a matter of time. The, I didn't see how they could keep it from coming here. Uh, there wasn't any particular deep scientific knowledge that I have, but I guess I've seen enough really lousy things during my career that uh, I'm not that much of an optimist all the time. So it just made sense. It was a gut feeling. And as you know, since you were my student, and you've now exceeded by far anything I could tell you, but as you may recall, I always said, trust your gut. And uh, I had an instinctive gut feeling. My stomach hurt that things were going to be great. Well, I wish your gut wasn't so correct, and uh, <laughs> and here we are now, uh, all of yeah. us, all of us suffering. So maybe we can try to blame you. Uh, Trump is trying to blame everybody, so we can. Blame yeah, you. Yeah. So on a serious <laughs> note, we should we should uh, point out that 136,000 people have died in the U.S., and the president continues to, at best, ignore, at worst, so misinformation and disinformation into everything that's happening. He wore a mask yesterday as if that was a big gesture, but that was out compared to what he had been doing. It was a good thing that he wore it. But as you know, his staff had to contrive and make up an event at which he could plausibly wear a mask. And that's why he went to Walter Reed Hospital. Just a really sad state of affairs. How do you judge the United States on its performance versus other countries? There was at this morning, uh, we talked about how the president's trying to open up all the schools. And he says, look at Scandinavia, they're opening the schools, so why can't we? Some of the countries that he pointed to had 10 and 11 new cases. We had 57,000 new cases the same day that he was pointing to them. So give us your take and take, and take your time to give us kind of a sense of where you see America and its leadership at this time. I think probably the best thing would be to study the uh, career of Caligula, the emperor of Rome, who, as we now know, you know, was a nut. He was a paranoid nut. And if you recall uh, the I. Claudius series on public television, at one point he was uh, talking to uh, Claudius and he said, I feel very funny. I think I'm turning into a god feel very strange. And I think that's where we are now. Uh, we have a, a strange man who had he not been born with a lot of money, might have wound up in jail, uh, in charge of a very powerful government. And he's a cunning man. He's used his power to get rid of anyone who uh, defies him intellectually. He's surrounded by a bunch of uh, very weak yes people. And uh, he spends most of his time in his bedroom, I think, or in his upstairs suite. Executive policies About uh, slights, insults, people plotting against him, 
And I think he spends a lot of time rehearsing in his mind how he will deal with that. He sort of talks to himself about it. And he's, he's smart. He comes up with uh, clever lines, you know, like you know, Sleepy Joe or Crooked Hillary. Or, you know, he rehearses that a lot. That's really where he spends most of his energy. I don't think he really understands how the government works or what the history of the United States is about. I really doubt if he's read the Constitution. If you read the Constitution, it's very clear. And I, re I read it every year. It's mostly about how to prevent someone becoming a king. And uh, he's trying to become a king. Luckily, and I must say, I don't really feel like a, uh, a religious person. In fact, I'm not a religious person. I'm very skeptical about religion. But you have to say, it gives me pause to see that some kind of divine intervention may have been responsible for first the virus, then when that wasn't enough, the upheaval, the social upheaval that we've had Black Lives Matter and other, and uh, it knocked him off his perch. And, you know, he's uh, hopefully going to be uh, incapable of climbing back up there. And hopefully we'll see the last of him after November. And it's going to be a very difficult job to rebuild. We, you know, after World War II, we created... Uh, a Pax Americana in the world. FDR had uh, some visionary ideas. He wasn't around to put it into effect, but he had put his people in and they knew what he wanted, the United Nations. There were all sorts of financial arrangements, Bretton Woods, others. The, the world became a much more interlocked place with checks and balances. And uh, that plus the uh, terrible trauma of the Europeans and Asians suffered in World War II because of the Nazis and the Japanese Imperial Army. Uh, people had very little taste for uh, armed conflict. But slowly, uh, or fanaticism. Uh, slowly that seems to be receding in the past, people are forgetting. And it, it took a person like uh, Trump, who himself is kind of a you know, warmonger, really, although he's such a coward that he's afraid to pull the trigger at the end. But he's trying to dismantle all of the checks and balances, all of the uh, institutional uh, relationships that we have set up among countries in the world. And if he were to win a second term, uh, we'd be back the way it was before World War I. You know, I remember I knew a U.S. diplomat during the uh, Balkan Wars uh, who worked on the Security Council. And, you know, the Security Council and Western Europe were spinning their wheels trying to figure out how to deal with this destabilizing war of aggression by the Serbians. And he said, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to start World War I. And uh, that's basically where we're at now nationalism, uh, prejudice, hatred, uh, racism, all, all the, uh, the old uh, games. But I'm, I am optimistic and I can share with you that my instinct is that uh, Trump will have to leave in November and we're in for a slog. So you're already looking past Trump, but I've been telling people not to do that because even though all the polling and everything might look like there is a chance, there's a good chance that he won't win. I think that uh, presuming that he is going to lose is uh, is is trouble. And even even at, even today, he has 40 percent of the country. He has 90 percent of the Republican Party. And as I hear things like oh, uh, Texas is in play. And that reminds me of Hillary Clinton being told Arizona is in play. It may be in play this year, but in 2016. So I'm not as positive as you, and that's why you're on the positivity. That's a, that's a generational thing. My daughter 
who's about your age also, uh, is very, very worried. Uh, I think if you examine the, uh, the uh, granular part of all of these polls, a lot of people who supported Trump previously are not supporting him. So it gives me a little more heart, but everyone has to register, everyone has to vote, and uh, we have to fight like hell to make sure that uh, Biden wins. I mean, I agree with you. So let me ask you a question. Uh, I I decided uh, that I'm not a daily journalist anymore after the 2016 election. I'm a, I'm a professor. I uh, do opinion journalism and commentary. So I could, in fact, talk and and say what I wanted and point out the problems of this administration. I felt very comfortable with that. Uh, the Josh Friedman who grew up as a journalist, uh, what would he say about the way we, you and I are talking right now uh, at a time when that was not the way, especially both of us were trained at Columbia Journalism School? Well, I'm not, you know, I'm retired. I'm not, uh, I, they took the shackles off when I retired. So. I feel liberated. Uh, I still, you know, I'm still indoctrinated with the idea of uh, people working as journalists and trying to be as objective as possible. I know that's a very uh, uh, demeaned concept these days, but, you know, I do think journalists have to understand their biases and overcome them if possible and reveal their, any uh, conflicts they have. and strive to uh, present the whole picture. That doesn't mean, you know, if you were covering the Nazis, you shouldn't, during World War II, it doesn't mean you had to call up Hitler and get a comment. You know, you didn't put in your article, Mr. Hitler could not be reached for comment. You know, there's, evil is evil. But uh, I haven't given up. The problem is that the uh, all of that, that system was enforced by editors, and we don't have editors anymore. So I think it's sort of dissolving. And uh, given the whole marketplace is changing, and I think people uh, in your generation and younger, much younger than you, are uh, feeling much more liberated to express their opinions in what they write or uh, video they take or whatever. You know they. Even if they write a so-called objective story, they can rush to Twitter and give their own opinion. So, so we're in, it's changing. Uh, it, it, it is changing, and that's that's what's interesting. So I have a newsletter which uh, comes out every Sunday, and uh, today we talked about uh, how COVID-19 is disrupting education in America in ways we never imagined. And then I wrote last week why 40% of Americans continue to uh, approve of President Trump, and yeah, I'd like and, to read that. Yeah, so the yeah, yeah. So everybody who, if if you didn't get this in your inbox, I hope you will subscribe. The uh, address is right here on the screen: streenet.substack.com. Streenet.substack.com. And in it, I uh, I've taken to writing what I believe is the truth. Uh, we're we're pro facts, pro truth, pro science but that can be interpreted as anti-Trump. That's the world we're in now. And people have called me out on it a little bit. And that's what's kind of interesting about that, that, they, that you can just being pro-truth or pro-facts or pro-science makes you anti-Trump and that's held against some people as we have seen. But well, that, that, that's what he pitches. I mean, that's his, his uh, guiding principle. But I want to go back to the 40%. I think you have to look more uh, closely at it. I think of the 40%, about a quarter or 10% don't understand the question. So you can disregard them. They're just completely out of it. Then another 5% probably don't even understand how the system works. You know, I, uh, I remember when I was canvassing, and this will date me for Jack Kennedy, door to door, I was shocked by the number of people who didn't know who the president of the United States was. This was in New Jersey. So uh, 
I don't know about that 40%. I think obviously we can say that about probably about 30% of the people in the United States, or maybe 25%, are either paranoid or kind of dumb. <laughs> and that's basically his supporters. I think basically brighter people, more objective people, uh, have, lost, have become disenchanted. As far as the truth, what you're saying about facts, I mean, that uh, that's obvious, but you may be tainted by uh, your earlier education. You know, I think there's been a tremendous increase in skepticism uh, by readers or viewers about the uh, veracity of what they're reading or watching. You know, they've, we don't know, it could be the Russians have spread all sorts of uh, uh, disinformation to try to make people lose faith. The uh, Certainly the Republican Party, in order to change what had been a minority into a majority coalition, has tried to destroy the credibility of the media. And Trump's taken that even further. So I'm not surprised that you get challenged because people don't believe the truth anymore. They don't believe there is a truth, many people. And that, that is that is so sad. One of the things we do on the show, Josh, is we uh, uh, take comments from people all over the world. So as I name the places they're watching, I wanna hear your reactions, any memories you have of the places, or if you've heard of the places, or if you've been there, tell us, and uh, we'll do this tour right now. So we're gonna start on and about. <laughs> Sorry? Never mind. I, I didn't hear you. Sorry. That's okay. All I right. said I won't use the word shithole. Okay, that's right. Yes, we won't say that. Uh, that that's what the president says. He also says yeah. enemies yeah. of the people. I and have a lot of shithole countries. <laughs> yeah. You've been to a lot of countries. Okay, Anand Babu says, hello from India. You've been. India. You know, Sri, I've never been to India. I really feel it's one of the real lax in my experience. I've been all around India. Yeah. I've never been there. I, I would love to go to India. And your yeah. classmate at Columbia Journalism School was one of India's leading journalists, N. Ram. And uh, N. Ram, I admire very much. He's invited me to come as his guest. And uh, we were classmates at Columbia. Yeah. Uh, I It's, you know, it's sort of like, I feel it must be like what I felt when I went to China. It's like stepping into another world, another dimension. You know, it's so many different cultural values and uh, customs and attitudes that I'm not familiar with. And on such a large scale, it's it's an alternative universe almost. That's the way it seems to me. I, I, I really would like to make sure I go there uh, before the end. That's... Yeah. Uh, that's a lack. That's a minus for me. I all admire right. India, although I'm very upset with what's happening there. I don't right. understand it. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, when I grew up, India was the model of humane behavior. Gandhi, Nehru, uh, you know, we looked at it as a pacifist nation, a, a uh, humble nation in terms of not wanting to be an imperialist country, even though it was very big. We admired it. Now I'm afraid that uh, it's sort of like what's happened in the U.S. It's been taken over by a bunch of uh, small-minded haters. I don't understand it. Wow, that's uh, small-minded haters is uh, yeah. what's happened in the U.S. for sure. Yeah, and that, yeah. Uh, well, let when the, you're going to agree with me or not? What no, so in, in, so India, I think, is uh, suffering through many of the same. Uh, instincts that are plaguing America, the uh, rise of the right, uh, the uh, attacks on the press, the suppression of minorities, all of that's happening in India as well. And we're seeing that the rise of the strong, uh, the strong man, the rise mm -hmm. of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, kind of conservative thought mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, it, they're all different flavors of con conservatism, but mm -hmm. uh, right wing, hard line, it's the uh, religious zealotry that really bothers me. Yeah, and, and that's the problem. It's just disgusting. Yeah. It's just terrible. And uh, what I really, another thing I don't understand is why so many Indians in the United States, and I think I've seen that they're the most highly educated 
ethnic group in the United States, why so many support uh, Modi? I don't, I don't get that. Well, you many know, of them also support Trump. And so that's a deadly combination. 40%, we know they're dumb. <laughs> no, so the, no, no, the, the Trump-Modi connection and the Indian Americans yeah. support them, it's a fascinating uh, study. My dad wrote a book about, uh, about Modi's foreign policy and uh, and in it, he, the cover is uh, Trump and Modi holding hands as they walked through Houston together. You may remember that. Yeah, uh, I'd yeah. like to look at that. Yeah, that is, yeah, it's called it's Modi. Uh, that, that's the people thing. like your father must be very disillusioned. I mean, it, you know, they fought for a, to build a better India than is now. It's yeah. terrible. So this anyway, is. The, this is the title of the. This let me just show you the, the book um, yeah. jacket here. So he, it's written in a uh, through the Shakespearean prism. So it's mode diplomacy through a Shakespearean prism, and here they are, uh, Mr. Modi yeah. and Mr. Trump together holding hands. Yeah, can I get it on Amazon? I believe so. You can. Sure. You can. You can certainly look. There's one. There is one left. So you can try to get that so, after. Okay. Is that a dollar yeah. or is that a rupee? What is that's that? in rupees. Six, yeah, that's in rupees. That's in, that's Amazon India. Yeah, it's not six hundred fifty-five dollars yet. It will be one day. Uh, let's keep yeah. going. Yeah. Let's keep going. Paula Kiger is watching from Tallahassee, Florida, and Paula is one of the producers of our New York Times read along, where we read the New York Times out loud on Facebook, and uh, we are doing that again next Sunday. Please join us when our guest host, Neil Parikh, will be hosting the show. And our guest will be Claire Smith, first woman inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame writer's wing and former New York Times columnist and current ESPN news editor. And Neil Parikh, who's our executive producer, will be guest hosting as I take a Sunday morning break for a change. So everybody, please tune in next Sunday for that and find all my archives on our website on, on YouTube, youtube.com slash Srinet. So please check that out. Let's keep going. Have you been to Tallahassee? No, but I've been in Florida. Of course you have, yeah. But it, uh, Tallahassee's up north, you know. Yeah. I, when I go there, I go to a warm place in the winter, <laughs> so if I can. Uh, Jonathan said, mm -hmm. hello from East Village. We just lost Odessa, beloved neighborhood restaurant. I must have, you know, they must have shut it down. They must have shut. They must have survived the pandemic. Yeah. Do you, are, yeah so, uh, what are your memories of the village? You used to work for the Village Voice, so let's tell people about that. I actually worked. I wrote for the Voice, but I ran a, a competitor called the Soho News. Soho Weekly right. News. Right. Was a competitor of the Voice. Uh, East Village. Uh, was in our readership area. You know, it went, it changed radically and then it kind of went into, uh, first it became degenerated, and, you know, became kind of lousy with drugs and stuff. And then I think it's probably being gentrified now. I don't know, but uh, uh, you know, when we, Sri, I don't know if you came on one of these, when I came back to Columbia and I was uh, working with the international students and let me interrupt for one minute to say that the international student par excellence that I had in my career was Sri Srinivasa. He was the first, in the first year that I was teaching, I had no idea how to teach. Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, like the rest of Columbia, is not the best managed institution in the world. I was hired on two weeks notice to uh, be the international division head. Luckily, Sri... So we had a uh, a uh, class called uh, New York as a Foreign Country, I think. New York as a Foreign Country. We there, right? Yeah. 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 And all the international students would get together, and there was they were all there. Sri was there as a young pursuit man, and uh, the, we'd have the class, and then after he'd, he'd sort of linger, and he'd come over and very nicely say. Why don't you do it this way? Can I suggest you try that? And you know, he, was, he had great ideas, and I absorbed. 
and he got me started on my teaching career. And then I got him started on his career, which has been very still. So the question is, what? I forgot. I uh, to there myself. Okay, we're going to keep moving. If we, if we stop, we'll just we'll go off the rails here. But I should point out that uh, many <laughs> years later, uh, I, I was, of course, Josh's colleague as a professor at Columbia. I was there for 20 years. And at one point, uh, by the vagaries of the management system, uh, poor Josh had to report to me. And uh, he took it very well in stride. And uh, he was not the best at, at all the bureaucracy of it, but he was a wonderful, inspiring teacher and uh, someone who, uh, who may gave everybody who he met a reason to smile and learn about journalism and care about journalism. And I've never forgotten that. But it was, it was quite the adventure. I was not a good bureaucrat. And I think that used to drive you nuts because I had to fill out all this stuff that you had to then pass along. <laughs> I never did it. <laughs> a lot of paperwork. Yes, that's right. Paperwork. That's right. Journalists so, like paperwork. So, uh, so let's, let's keep going. Next, uh, yeah, let's, let's go to uh, Long Island. So you work for Newsday. So talk a little bit about Long Island. When we were Newsday, Newsday was very, very good to me. It was one of the richest newspapers in the United States when I worked for it. I found out later from Dave Levin's old publisher. It was owned by the Los Angeles Times. It was really we seem to have uh, lost Josh. Uh, have that happen with the news? So his connection will be very strong. He's in a rural part of upstate New York, so hopefully he'll come back in, in a couple of minutes uh, or soon. Uh, but uh, you're watching my conversation with Josh Friedman, my former professor, Pulitzer Prize winner, and uh, the vice chair of the Perry Center for Global Good. And we're going to hear all about it when he comes back in just a couple of minutes. Please share this with your friends and family around the world. Uh, this is our Sunday Night Positivity Show. The idea is that uh, even in the midst of everything, there is reason and opportunity to be a little positive. And that's what we're trying to do on this show. So please share this with your friends and family. We would love to uh, get your comments and your thoughts about where things are. I'll point out a couple of things while we wait for Josh to join us. Uh, one of the things that we have learned is that New York's uh, officials reported zero coronavirus cases for the first time since March 11th, when the first death happened. And here is Jody Cantor, first Thing every morning I check New York City's numbers and pray for this extraordinary progress to continue. This is where we go all the way down to zero. And uh, we just hope that that can be the case in the rest of the United States. But we are so, uh, sorry, I was trying to show you that, but I didn't. One second. Uh, this, this is a chart from Jody Cantor. First thing every morning I check New York City's numbers and uh, and pray for the extraordinary progress to continue. And uh, that's one of the ways in which we kind of think about the, uh, the crisis and the virus. Uh, while we're waiting for Josh to come back, let me play an ad from uh, one of our sister programs, uh, She's On Call, which is a great medical show that we now run every Sunday. So here's the ad from She's On Hi, I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon in New York City and New Jersey. And I'm Dr. Marina Kurian. I'm a general surgeon in New York City area. We'd like to introduce you to our new show, She's On Call. We air live on social media platforms from 11 a.m. to noon every Sunday, Eastern Time. We discuss the medical topics of the week. We have two great guests, experts in their field that help us analyze and look at some of the topical issues of healthcare. And we are on 11 to 12, so please join us. We'd love to answer your questions, so please share and watch and send us your questions and comments. See you Sundays at 11. Thanks, folks. I hope you found that interesting and I hope you will please make sure you check out She's On Call on Facebook and on Twitter. We're waiting for Josh Friedman to join us again. 
Uh, this is what happens with the vagaries of internet access. He's in a rural part of New York, and he'll be, I hope, joining us soon. He is supposed to uh, come back on if, uh, if the, unless the internet's completely dropped out, and that's kind of the fun and pain of doing live shows like this. Uh, as 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 you all know, let's check out the comments as people come in uh, from uh, as people talk here. Uh, Rajan has put in a, a link to my father's book, T. P. Srinivasan's book, Di Mo Diplomacy Through a Shakespearean Prism. And uh, let's go back here and look at who all are watching and uh, who's here. Uh, Mark uh, says hello from Durham, North Carolina. Hi, Mark. Great to always have you here. Steve's watching from Philadelphia. Uh, Steve's part of our awesome. New York Times read along crew uh, that we discussed that we mentioned already. And uh, Rick says, Josh's gut was informed by scientific understanding. And that, of course, is important as you think about where and when we understand the problems of international affairs. Uh, and uh, Steve says, I need to reread the Constitution. Thank you for the reminder, Josh. Friedman reads the Constitution every year, rereads it. Mm -hmm. How many of you do that? I think that would be something that we should all be doing. And uh, Rick Botello says, the Lincoln Project must go beyond anti-Trumpism to focus on the positivity of true heroic patriotism and unrig the deep state of fake patriotism. And that's certainly one of the things that we're seeing, for those of you not familiar with it, the uh, Lincoln Project mm -hmm. uh, aims to bring attention to the problems of uh, the Trump administration, and these are conservatives who have, and Republicans who have come back to uh, talk uh, uh, publicly about the problems with Mr. Trump and his policies, and uh, that's what's called the Lincoln Project. Some of you saw that President uh, Trump uh, every few days kind of rediscovers that Lincoln was a Republican, mm -hmm. and he will say things like, most people didn't know that, nobody knew that, people didn't know that. Everybody knows that Lincoln was a Republican, except Donald Trump, someone who knows nothing about American history. And uh, Ashok says the education crisis in the US is a major concern with foreign students asked to leave the country in the near future. Mm. How will that decision have an impact now? This is something that we, we're definitely tracking very closely. And we're gonna have an episode on this topic very soon. And we were waiting to kind of get some more clarity. You saw that MIT and Harvard have uh, voted, uh, sorry, have sued the president and the administration about this policy that says you have to uh, reopen by, um, by saying you have to, you can't take classes online. You have to be in a situation where you have in-person classes. And that is just outrageous and to use students and their safety as pawns in this effort to reopen the economy. Really problematic. Ying says, hi, Josh. Uh, Ying from Hong Kong is watching. Love your optimism. And I'm hoping that Josh will be with us uh, in any minute. I'm going to ask him to uh, come back into that link. Uh, and thank you, folks, for um, for watching. While you're, while you're waiting, let me remind you of a show that we have coming up that you won't want to miss. And this is uh, a show that is uh, coming up on Thursday, Little Steven's Roadshow. And uh, you will really enjoy it. This is Little Steven. You know him from the E Street Band, and you know him from The Sopranos, and you also know him from uh, Lilyhammer, one of my favorite uh, Netflix shows. In fact, the first of the Netflix originals. Um, and um, it is now, of course, so many more folks are in, um, in uh, uh, so many thousands of more Netflix originals, but that was a very first Netflix original. So please go to teachrock.org slash roadshow. And, uh, and that's this Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And guests include Kanya Das, Kid Leo, Michael Stanley, and Neil Giraldo will be speaking with little, little Steven, uh, and that's D.V. Van Zandt. So please do check this out. It's coming up this Saturday, uh, this Thursday. Josh tells me that he is trying and will uh, join. Will do his best to join us. I'm going to tell him that he can also join, uh, also by uh, by joining us from his phone. But let's see. There he is. I hear him. And here he is. Josh, I see you. 
check it out. It's coming up this Saturday, uh, this Thursday. Josh tells me that he is trying. You see me? And will, uh, I see you, Josh. I see you. Turn yeah. off your phone or whatever else you have on there. Uh, what? By, hold on. Um, I hear you talking. From his, there you go. There we go. You're, you're, okay. You're hearing okay. Me on, on, on something. Okay, good. Now, uh, just know, adjust, yeah. let's let's keep adjusting there, and uh, you're back. This is the fun yeah. of live television, and you're looking better than ever. Yes. All right. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Where were we? I forget. Uh, it's okay. Uh, can you just adjust the headset a little? Uh, I mean, the just a little more. Yeah, I don't want to cut off your chin there. Okay. There you go. Nice. Okay. Go my head. That's How's good. That? Okay. That's good. That's good. Don't touch it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming back. I didn't know if you had left me forever. Ying Chan says, hello, Josh. Ying from oh, Hong Kong. Love you. I miss you. I haven't seen Ying in, since we went to uh, Burma together. That's the correct way to say it, Burma. And we why, have... why do you say that and not Myanmar? I, I spent time as a child when it was Burma. I call yeah. it Burma. Why do you call it Myanmar? Why do you not call it Myanmar? Myanmar connotes that the uh, dominant ethnic group is the uh, dominant ethnic group and runs it. Burma is a much more politically neutral way to say it. But you know, it is the name of the country. What can you what can you do about it just because authoritarians are in charge? <laughs> no, the thing is, it's true. I mean, I don't recommend following the Articles of Confederation. You know, we have the Constitution. It was now that Aung San Suu Kyi is in power, I guess we can stop calling it Burma because she goes along with the program, but I think the, they were encouraging the use of Burma. There are many ethnic groups in Burma, Myanmar, and the non-dominant one, ones are treated very badly. I mean, the Rohingya are famous, but there are other groups that are also treated badly. It's it's not a good situation. I think there's a, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's an acceptance among the dominant group of kind of racism towards the other ethnicities. It's kind of the way we treat Native Americans here. It's a, it's not a good situation. I, I hear you. And that's something we have to pay close yeah. attention to. Also the role- We and I were there together. Yeah. We were trying to, uh, Soros sent us, we were supposed to, there was a huge phalanx of teachers from Columbia and other places and we were supposed to help upgrade the edu higher education system. And we went to see the way they were teaching journalism in the official university. It was sad. <laughs> Most of the teachers were geographers. <laughs> they, didn't know, they didn't know what journalism was, but Ying was very resourceful. And whatever we could do, we did. Uh, folks, if you're just joining us, I'm in conversation with Josh Friedman, a Pulitzer Prize winning international journalist. And uh, he is also an early chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists, which we'll talk about. We'll also talk about the Cary Center for Global Good. And this is our positivity show. So that's got to be the most positive title of them all. Tell us about the Cary Center for Global Good. Uh, you know, things happen accidentally in life, right? So after I retired from the journalism school because my wife was working up here as the state parks commissioner, New York state parks commissioner. And uh, I figured I'm retired, you know. And uh, in our little village was an institute which ran into financial trouble. And a very wealthy guy, a billionaire with a B, B is a boy, lived in, he came on weekends, Bill Carey. He made a fortune in real estate. And we, he was a Republican, but a very, he called himself a Bloomberg Republican. And my wife and I and some others talked him into buying this institute. And he came up with the name. And uh, he said, I'll buy it if Carol, my wife, runs it. Since none of the rest of us know how to run anything. But uh, it's a very small village, just a few hundred people. It's a beautiful place. It looks like a small college. Uh, we can put up close to 100 people. We have 100 acres. We have a beautiful theater, a restaurant, very nice place. Shortly after uh, all of this happened, and as we were uh, preparing to uh, 
take over at the Institute. Uh, Bill died. He dropped dead at lunch in Palm Beach. Fitting way to go. And we were stuck. But anyway, we created two or three programs, which until the uh, COVID-19 were doing quite well. One is the Logan nonfiction program, which I mentioned earlier, which has, uh, we've had over 150 people. They do nonfiction books, documentaries, uh, photo essays or photo books, any medium really. The whole, it's just based on the essential is that the applicant is doing a lot of reporting of fact, which is what you like, Sri. The purpose of the thing is to bring well-reported, well-substantiated facts to the attention of the public. And we've had some great books. Uh, the other program we have is uh, a program which is still going because it's more virtual and digital than in person, helping uh, te teaching teacher, teaching ordinary people to be teachers of refugees. And that's both in the US and in refugee camps in places like Syria, Jordan, where the demand was so great that uh, the pool of teachers ran out and parents and others just sort of jumped into the fray and attempted to fill the gap. And so our program uh, gives them many courses in pedagogy and gives certificates and so on because people in many countries like to have a plaque on the wall saying they're an official such and such. And uh, hopefully we're upgrading the level of education because as we know from places like Gaza and other places, when the education system collapses, a whole generation becomes uh, lost. And in fact, we're skirting that now in the United States. Uh, we work with local farmers. We help them. Uh, we've responded to the brewery industry, which is growing locally because of tax changes in the, that the Cuomo administration made. Farm, we're helping farmers pair up with brewers and grow the right kind of hops and products in New York State that entitle the brewers to get a tax exemption. Uh, we do community stuff. Uh, to make money, we have weddings. Uh, it's a beautiful place for that. And uh, we have NGOs who meet there. It's a good place for retreats and so on. But we're dead in the water now because the Cuomo administration rightfully, rightly, does not allow any gathering more than of more than ten people. And our whole raison d'etre is gathering people together at our institute. So the uh, nonfiction program is on is in a hiatus, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. It's there's one of the groups now. Yeah, there's some uh, some of our fellows. We give them there's some brewers and farmers. They're growing. Uh, uh, hops or something that I couldn't see. Barley, maybe. The uh, it's this is a very rural area where we are. It's up in the mountains. It's sort of almost like Appalachia. How um, far away from how far away from New York is New York City? Is it? The drive is about two and a half to three hours. And what's the nearest big town? Rensselaerville. Rensselaerville. It looks like a little Norman Rockwell village. It's and what is the nearest big town? Albany. Albany, okay. And we got a large collection of writers, artists, photographers in the town because, you know, for those people who are seeking country living, Columbia County across the Hudson from us is quite fashionable. But Albany County, where we are, is not fashionable. And so the real estate prices are much lower for beautiful farms and houses. But a lot of people are like lemmings, you know. They, they only want to go where all the other fancy people go. But so it's reasonably priced for creative people. So we have a great number of artists and other creative people here. It's a lovely little place. And uh, we've been coming here since the 70s. We know everybody, you know, we're sort of like almost natives. It takes a couple of generations to become a native. I knew that from where I grew up. The, uh, but we're sort of proto, we're pseudo natives. <laughs> We were accepted by the native to some degree. Uh, 
Let's let's see some of the other comments coming in. My mom's watching from Kerala, India. Love you, Amma. Great to see you. Oh, again. Mrs. Srinivasan, how are you? You produced a good son there. Thank you. Thank you. A friend. Uh, you know Kerala, I didn't realize that. I thought you came uh, from Delhi. No, my I, yeah. I, we I came to the Columbia from Delhi, where I was a journalist. Uh, Twenty. In 1993, but yeah. my, my parents live in Kerala. They were we're from Kerala. That's where your family is from. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, it's a nice place out right here. Yes, it is God's own country. We call it. Uh, Mark says a friend of mine said in India. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Mark says a friend of mine said they thought 30 percent can't make their mortgage, but then they also had heard figures actually 70 percent. Which figure do you think is right? Uh, he's talking about the economic crisis. How bad do you think it is? And are you seeing some of the reasons why people in rural America are more tend to be more conservative or more going yeah, along? Let me tell you, that, you know, I kind of suspected Trump was going to win during the campaign. I had a lot of friends of mine in New York who thought I was crazy. But as I say, we're up here in Appalachia, as it were. And I know a lot of, I have friends, you know, who come who live here all for generations. The people had farms till the depression and then, you know, they, they got other jobs because the farming uh, economy collapsed unless you have a large farm. And this is not the most, we have long winters. It's not the best place to grow stuff. The soil all washed down to the Hudson Valley. We're on the lip of the Hudson Valley. So most farmers that still, where farmers did it in part-time, they would drive a school bus or they would get a job at a local factory or whatever. Over the last 20 or 30 years, Albany, which had an industrial base, was carved out. Uh, the Everything uh, that was producing uh, income for them dried up and now the local schools are closed. They're not having any school buses, which, you know, if surprisingly is a large uh, support, a large source of income for people on the countryside. Uh, the state is broke. A lot of state employees are being laid off. So this compounded what existed even before Trump ran. People were desperate. Their kids could not get educations they couldn't, uh, the kids were taking drugs, a lot of opioids. The kids couldn't get jobs that matched what level the parents had. They were lost. It was a lost generation. They, uh, it was terrible. I mean, it was really, uh, uh, kids were going to jail. It was, it was terrible. So I think that's why Trump won. Trump responded to this by saying, and the people felt, by the way, very uh, disrespected by people from places like New York City uh, because they didn't have college educations and so on. The uh, Trump said, look, I like you. I like the uneducated. They're my people. And uh, you're the best. You're, you know, it's a sales technique. Salesmen, you know, the, the first step you do is you sort of make the client or the customer feel good about themselves. You tell them they have a nice house if you're visiting their house. Tell them they have a nice car, nice children, whatever. That's what Trump does, you know. You're great. You're a real American. You know, you're the salt of the earth. All those other people are terrible people. They're not real Americans. You're the backbone. You know, he, he flatters them. And so they voted for him. I don't know if they're going to vote for him now because their economic situation is so bad. And as the questioner Mark was saying, People are defaulting on their mortgages. I think for the moment, there you know there are certain uh, forgiveness programs so that they can postpone the pain. Some of them forgive the money completely. Others require it to be paid later. But you know, a lot of these people were having two two uh, earner households. They're down to one earner or no earner. Healthcare is is terrible. They don't have insurance. Uh, they were getting insurance through their uh, employer. It's, I like the depression. It's very scary. And uh, that 
does offer a climate that welcomes the kind of crap that Trump peddles, racism and nationalism and so on. But uh, I don't see, this is an, in, an interesting indicator. And when Trump ran against Hillary, this place was planted with Trump signs all over the place, except our little village where we had a lot of Hillary signs and Bernie signs, actually more Bernie's. Uh, I don't see very many Trump signs anymore. It's interesting. I think people are sort of, uh, you know, they may not like Biden, they don't like the Democrats, but I think they've lost some faith in Trump. He really bungled the disease. We don't have very much COVID, by the way. I don't know of any, I don't think, there was a rumor of one case in Rensselaer, but I don't know if it happened. And now that Cuomo has done his thing, uh, COVID is really not that scary. We do have a problem with some wise guys who don't want to wear masks. You know, it's become a uh, a mark of uh, virility. Only in what country is it like that? Well, the other country, we did a show yesterday about Brazil. And Brazil also, they have a, what's called the tropical Trump. And uh, in some ways worse, it's hard to imagine someone who is and more misogynist and more yeah. homophobic, but he yeah. is. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's keep reading these comments. And uh, let's see here. Margaret de Piazza says, uh, don't believe the 40%. Definitely maybe 10% are for Trump. Any scientist has to be not for Trump. I don't think there are that many scientists in this country. Uh, and Josh, can we adjust your chin, please, again? Can you just sit up? Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, there you go. You got it. Um, I think it's so overwhelming and confusing with mixture of info. Trump is a sick man. I personally believe people do believe in the truth. I'm in New York City. Well, well maybe, uh, the problem is in New York City, you have, uh, you're reinforced by other people who agree with you. That's not the case up here necessarily. And people's access to the news and to information is mostly uh, outside of our little village. It's uh, Fox, it's um, uh, Sinclair. Sinclair, which is an evil place, owns one of the three local stations, the CBS affiliate here is owned by Sinclair. They run a lot of right-wing nonsense. Uh, the uh, radio, they listen to the radio. You know, if I say to someone, you ought to listen to NPR. They say, what's that? They never heard of NPR. Most of them have never watched PBS. They, uh, so it's hard to uh, uh, believe uh, in the truth if you're not getting access to the truth. Even so, I think people have lost faith in Trump because he's a bad manager. You know, he, he's not handling this disease correctly. He's making a fool of himself with the mask situation. Uh, there, you know, there was a lot of uh, social unrest because of what happened in Minneapolis. The stock market has gone through the floor. So, you know, people are uh, uh, disgruntled if they have a retirement plan, a 401k. And a lot of people weren't that rich have 401ks. Not much in it, but they have them. And uh, people have lost their jobs. So... Uh, that truth is being uh, manifested. We don't have many scientists up here. <laughs> Trump is watching from Canada. Tell us about Canada. I love Canada. You know, I didn't, during the Vietnam War, we used to go to Canada on a weekend just to sort of breathe some free air. It was, you know, I was uh, when I covered the uh, state government many years ago. It was not a it's an easy drive up to Montreal from here, from Albany. I love Canada. You, you, you were in the class of 68. What? Sorry, I was going to say you were in the class of United States, a yeah. sane version of the United States. It's like our cousin or sibling who somehow didn't bang their head on the floor and came out sane. <laughs> Talk about uh, the class of 68 at Columbia and what it was like to be here and at the time of the Vietnam War, what was it like to be a young man who could have been drafted? What was the story there? Did you have friends who were drafted? Talk about all of that, please. Yeah, it was not good. Uh, 
luckily I was a little ahead. I still was vulnerable to the draft, but, uh, and I had to take the steps that even Trump took uh, till I was 26. That was the magic age. So what I did, and I hated the war. I figured if I go to the Vietnam War, I'm either going to go nuts because I kill people or I'm going to get killed. And that's even worse. So, you know, it was a very unpalatable alternative. I went After college, I went into the Peace Corps, which actually affected my life hugely. I, I don't know if I would have gone in if I didn't have to, I wanted to be a reporter. But I went in. It stayed, kept me out of the draft. It was great. Changed so to understand, if you went into the Peace Corps, you were exempt from the draft. You were deferred. You weren't exempt. You were deferred till you got out. And, uh, and so you kept trying to do things to get to 26. Yeah, so once I got out of the Peace Corps, I still had a few years to burn up. I went to graduate school in University of Chicago studying history. I had been in a beautiful country, Costa Rica, in the Peace Corps. I was very lucky. There I was in Chicago, the winter. The wind is called the hawk. I'm sitting in the library doing research with all these automatons and everybody's peering into it. It was horrible. I mean, <laughs> Then I decided, well, I want to be a journalist. Anyway, I knew that. So Columbia offered a one-year program, which was great. That was going to bring me to 26. So I applied to Columbia. I transferred to Columbia Journalism School. There, my a classmate, Tony Marrow, who later became my boss as the editor of Newsday, said that the class at Columbia is about 50% women and about 50% draft dodgers. <laughs> It was, uh, so I did make it, I, I managed to, but uh, at the, uh, during the, uh, the war was terrible. It was, I mean, it was uh, the whole war movement, which started off somewhat idealistically had become violent toward the end. Uh, SDS had, been, had split, had become violent, became, you know, people, their bombs were being set, it was, you know, the society was really falling apart. It was it was very scary. Uh, 1968 at Columbia had a little bit of that flavor in the fall, in the spring. Uh, the SDS took over the school, essentially. It's hard to tell. There was another faction of black people who didn't want to have anything to do with the uh, white demonstrators or the white occupiers because they occupied buildings. The, uh, for some reason, I don't know who started it, there were rumors that black people from below Morningside Heights would invade, which was ridiculous, invade the campus. It, the school was being run by a uh, smug, a very smug kind of Republican, old style Calvin Coolidge type president, Grayson Kirk. Uh, the deans were uh, having nervous breakdowns the school ground to a halt. Uh, anarchy reigned on the campus. The uh, police came on. They were very uh, resentful of all of these, uh, what they considered rich, spoiled kids who were students at Columbia. They tried to beat the shit out of us and succeeded often. I, I was whacked on the top of my head, even though I wasn't an occupier. Uh, I had grown up in a community with a lot of leftists. Uh, a cooperative community. And I took a jaundiced view of the revolution taking over the United States. I, I had grown up with this previous generation of people who said that. So what happened at the Columbia Journalism School was we all started being journalists and we began selling stuff. One person became an occupier. The rest of us were selling uh, news. I had a little, uh, what then was the... Uh, version of a video camera, it was called a, I uh, forget the name of it, it was like a 16 millimeter small camera, you would wind it like that and take pictures. So I was taking pictures of the police beating professors. I was very excited. I rushed down to CBS and they put it on all of the national news shows. And at the time, Grayson Kirk, the Coolidge figure, was saying, there's no violence on the campus. And of course, this is a rebutted him. Then the next thing happened, we got out, no graduation to speak of. We had a kind of little thing in uh, 
a little ceremony at the school. The university did not have a graduation. Then the summer starts and everybody's going nuts because of the war and the democratic convention coming up and all sorts of uh, violences in the, in the wind, which then took place. And the police, you know, in Chicago, we were very happy to beat the crap out of all these spoiled kids, which they did. And uh, the pol politics of the country were so polarized that many people who would have voted for the Democrat, Humphrey, uh, were voting as if they were members now, current members of the Green Party or diehard Bernie supporters. And Nixon took advantage of it and won. And of course, then we went into tremendous repression. And uh, it was all in all not a happy time. We had some wild parties. Marijuana was all over the place. It was uh, sexual revolution was in full blast. The pill was around. You know, there were, from a lifestyle point of view, it was kind of exciting. But from a political and uh, intellectual and uh, uh, just spiritual point of view, it was horrible. It was, uh, the place was falling apart. So let me ask you that. I've, I've been wondering, I've been wanting to talk to somebody who lived through the times when, uh, you know, marijuana was uh, so verboten and now we're in a different world. What would- I can young tell you exactly what happened. You know, when I went into the Peace Corps, it was 1965. Lyndon Johnson was the president. He had just taken over from Jack Kennedy. No one smoked marijuana. Marijuana was considered, you know, like heroin or something. No one knew what it was. Everybody was buttoned down tie, uh, shirts and, you know, ties and so on, blazers. They came back two and a half years later. And everyone is, all the men had beards and long hair. I went to a few parties. And uh, all of my old friends are, you know, hairy and smoking marijuana. <laughs> and all the women are feeling quite liberated sexually. It was like, a, it was like uh, Woody Allen's sleeper, you know, when uh, they say, he comes, goes in the future and they say, what happened? They say, a man named Albert Shanker got a hold of a nuclear device. Of course, you, many of you don't know who Albert Shanker was, but he was a powerful labor leader. It was the world turned up on, upside down on its head. You know, music had changed. When I went away, I think the Beatles were just starting to uh, be known in the United States. You know, you had the Kingston Trio and, you know, very clean button down folk music. By the time I got back, you know, the music was uh, uh, much more radical and uh, everything changed. People were very disaffected. And marijuana became uh, quite widespread. I don't think it ever became not widespread, frankly. I mean, I think it achieved acceptance. It was uh, illegal, but I don't think the New York police, I'm not, if you were white, they didn't bother you. If you were black, they did bother you. And that's one of the uh, underlying uh, Black Lives Matter uh, complaints, you know. Lots of black people, black men, wound up incarcerated for very minor drug violations and uh, created uh, a class of people with uh, prison records. You know, if you look at it objectively, and this has bothered me since the 70s, certainly, and the 60s, really, the uh, what advanced nation keeps one third of an ethnic group in the justice of justice system or in jail. Some are in prison, some are in jail. They haven't even had trials yet. It's a bizarre situation. I think historians are going to look back on it and think it was very strange. I mean, it's surprising, frankly, how unviolent the black population is considering what's been done to them. Of course, you know, you had people like Edgar Hoover and so on. They did their best to uh, destroy black leadership in the late 60s. And uh, another thing that's interesting with what's happening now 
is, you know, in the uh, late 60s when they had the Kerner Commission and, you know, everyone's wondering why are the blacks running down the neighborhoods and so on. There were no blacks to speak of working in the media. There were no blacks in the police departments, very few. There were very few of any blacks in Congress. And there were no black governors. There were no black senators except one Republican, Edward Brooke. There were very few congressmen. The legislature had a few black people, but not a very large amount. When people talked about Hispanics, they just met Puerto Ricans. There wasn't any immigration really till 65 of all of the other Latin Americans that came here. So when people began to complain about the bad treatment by police and authorities of uh, black people in the late 60s, there were mainly black people complaining. Most white people didn't really get it. And the press didn't really tell the white people what was happening. And white people were not going into black neighborhoods. They didn't know. And even till now, I mean, I, again, historians are going to look back and wonder why most white people do not have any black friends in my generation. In my daughter's generation, that's not true anymore. I mean, she went to a much more integrated school. And I think even younger people in their 20s are even more likely to have sort of interracial friendships. But white people in the late 60s had no idea really what was going on with black people. And frankly, black people had no idea what was going on with white people, except that they were meeting pretty nasty ones, wearing uniforms and so on. So now we have many black people, not enough, but many black people in positions of authority in local government, state government. So the response to the Black Lives Matter complaints is much more nuanced, much more interesting. You know, city councils, much many big cities are run by black officials now, and city councils have majority of black officials, or at least a very large number of them. So they're responding much more aggressively to what's happened uh, to the the uh, look we've had at the way police treat black people. I wanted to just show you the story. If you haven't seen, it's fascinating. This is about Jerron Smith, who is the highest ranking uh, uh, African-American in the White House. Uh, there is obviously Ben Carson, but he's not in the White House. And uh, he, this man wore a hoodie <laughs> Not in the world, actually. <laughs> yeah, he's he, he's in Egypt with the granaries inside the uh, inside the pyramids. But uh, Mr. Smith once wore a hoodie in a demonstration on Capitol Hill, protesting the death of Trayvon Martin. Really? Now President Trump calls him my star. And a fascinating, uh, in-depth look at Jaron. He did not oh, participate in the in the uh, interview with the New York Times, but I learned so much from this. And oh. uh, and it's fascinating. I'll have to read it. Yeah. Well, you uh, know, there are there have always been black conservatives. I don't know if this guy's a conservative, but no, he is. He was. He by the way, this was his his point, and this is what uh, Trump also says. He said he grew up in in um, in Cleveland with a mother who was addicted uh, to uh, to drugs, and his father raised him, and he saw that Cleveland, run by Democrats, was in such bad shape. Uh, therefore, he became a, uh, a black Republican instead yeah. of, uh, you know, one of the rare black Republicans at that time in Cleveland. Yeah, and, yeah, and so that's well, what so he he's I have to read it, but he's there because he's a Republican, not because he's a Trump lover, probably. And, you know, they don't have a very large field to pick people from if they want to have some non-white faces in the White House. But just look at the pictures when Trump has these uh, meetings, you know, and he invites the press in. White, older white men, that's all they have. That's right, yeah. Uh, let's, let's keep going, Doug Levy. Sorry, these are the guys ahead. who look like, they look like the guys who would fire you. <laughs> <laughs> these are, you know, it's it's so obvious what the problem is. He's, right. cut, he's completely cut off from reality. He is. Uh, Doug Levy says, I'm under the redwood trees in Marin County, California, not quite upstate New York, but I'm okay here. Thanks for the interesting discussion. Great. Are you under a tree now? I wonder. Uh, I wonder. Well, that's uh, nice. I, like the I, show, 
Ashok Sharma has invited you to Kerala. I would like to have you here once the crisis is over. Uh, Ashok has been doing a great job of inviting everybody to Kerala. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people are actually keeping track. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of uh, guests if he's not careful. Well, I'll talk to Sri. Maybe he can help me figure out how to, how to get there. But I'm afraid it's going to take a while before we find a cure for this thing. When do, when do you predict you will get on an airplane again? Not for a year. I mean, even if there's a vaccine, which it's not going to be given to the public until the middle or end of next year because they have to test it. You know, they have to uh, test it on a lot of people and they have to make sure that it's going to work efficiently because if they if they use uh, a defective vaccine, it's just going to play into the hands of anti-vaxxers and create uh, uh, an unwillingness to take the vaccine. People will be afraid of it. And that's my worry that even if there is a good vaccine, that Americans, 30% of them who've been poisoned, I mean, maybe, maybe more than that, poisoned by Trump, right. Jenny McCarthy, and of all people, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., right? Like well, he's, he's had a drug addict addict too, you know. Sorry? I mean, he had a substance abuse problem. He's, uh, he's got some interesting ideas. My wife used to be his babysitter, by the way. No, are you serious? Tell us that story. My wife worked for Bobby Kennedy in the Justice Department and uh, very involved with all sorts of exciting things like the uh, uh, search for Werner, Shaney, and Goodman, which was, you know, the subject of Mississippi burning, which I think was not accurate because it made the FBI look good. And uh, she was on the uh, Hoffa prosecution after uh, Bobby was assassinated, uh, Ethel was out at the, uh, I forget what they called the estate. This is before I met my wife. My wife's a very good manager, very, very practical person. They asked her to go out there and sort of whip the household into shape. And the kids were all kids. And so Bobby Kennedy, when I met him at the J school once, he said, your wife was my babies. <laughs> she stayed there for months, I think, until, until things calmed down. It was, you know, it was a horrible shock. And they had a lot of little kids there. It was a very bad situation. So and, uh, and Bobby Kennedy Jr., Robert Kennedy Jr. has been good about the environment and uh, yeah. cleaning up the river. And so how, what, do you have any theories about why he is like this about the vaccine? You know, it's a personality thing. I, I, I don't know other than to have met him once. I, you know, maybe he's a rigid person. I don't know, does he have autistic children? Some people with autistic kids or, right. uh, f f have taken that position. I don't know, you know. That's okay. Uh, let's keep going. Doug Levy says, I remember Odessa, the restaurant that's closed down uh, in San Francisco. He remembers the New York restaurant. And uh, yeah, Rose says, I know Odessa too. And that's closed down now. I wish I had gone there. They probably had good borscht shav, which is a potato soup. And uh, I used to go on the uh, Lower East Side to Sammy's Romanian restaurant, which was good because both, both of my grandmothers came from what was then Romania. And uh, so I grew up eating their Romanian Jewish food. It's quite tasty. Sammy's was sort of good. It was a little greasy. Not, not as good as... My grandmother's conditions were much better. Yeah. They weren't greasy. <laughs> Mark says the amount of restaurants and other small businesses that are going bankrupt and are getting to ridiculous are getting to ridiculous rates around the country. Yes. Can you talk for a minute about being, you know, your family was was Jewish and what it was like now to see that being Jewish is uh, we had a, a friend of ours, Linda Bernstein, saying that she is it, it's it's been interesting for her to being in America that now, you know, she's considered as somebody who is white when Jewish people were not considered white right. for a long time. Can you talk about that? Because not when everybody has up, that history. Yeah, when I grew up, my father, I remember once we were driving around in New Jersey where I grew up in a rural area. And he drove through some communities. He said, you know, Jews can't live here. And then he explained to me how, you know, Jews couldn't get jobs in certain places. This was true when I was a kid. Uh, when I went to high school, in my community, in the cooperative community, there were mainly Jews who were also farmers. 
And uh, I didn't know until I got to high school the Jews were not in the majority. That's how sheltered I was. But when I got to high school... Wait, you I, thought Jews were the majority community? Because that, that's what who you knew. That's all I knew. We were stuck there in this little rural cooperative. I was very nice to the few non-Jews who were there. Very nice. <laughs> we got to high school, which was like a central school. And uh, the girls thought we were very exotic. It was terrific. The boys all tried to beat us up. <laughs> they hated, they hated, uh, that was very anti-Semitic, very anti-Semitic in that high school. You know, it was, we had to say the New Testament was the Bible that was used in the classroom. At that time, you had to say prayers in school. You had to say the Lord's Prayer to eat in the cafeteria. You know, it was uh, uh, very uh, traditional, backward almost. Wait, the, uh, I had, one second, what? in a public school? Yes, they had to say prayers. Why? Well, I thought the separation of uh... it came later. Came later. How old are you? <laughs> I'm 29 years old. <laughs> I'm 78. I was born in 1941. You certainly are a probing questioner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, because I, I was serious. So this is how little I understand of this. Then you know the town, Heights Town was segregated. It was in central New Jersey. Exit 8, if there are any New Jerseyans listening. Everything was segregated. The barber shops, the bars, the movie theater. Blacks sat on the left, whites on the right. The people from my little cooperative, Roswell, we sat on the left just to show what self-righteous snobs we were. We sat with on the black side. But uh, there were no blacks in our community. Absolute segregation. The blacks, we used to have a dance on top of the firehouse every Saturday night. It was called Teen Canteen. So some of the black students said, we'd like to uh, come to the teen, you know, we want to have a dance too. So they started a Teen Canteen on Friday nights for them. They wouldn't allow the blacks and the whites to be together in the same dance where they were dancing together. There was one person from our cooperative used to go out with a black guy in high school. It was so odd. It was such a scandal. One, it was just one case of a mixed couple. Even when I got to college, it was very rare to see black people in the college. It was at Rutgers, the state university. You'd think there'd be a lot of black, there weren't that many black people. It was, uh, you know, this was in uh, the late 50s, early 60s. It was, it was like the South almost. That's why, you know, I think a lot of black people say they feel better in the South because at least the people are out front about it. The, uh, anyway, getting back to the Jewish thing, I've never gotten rid of the feeling that I'm in a minority here. This may be what Linda was saying. I don't know how old she is. You know, I'm always aware if I'm the only Jewish person around in a group, although it doesn't affect me. I don't, I think like I'm in a majority. It's odd, right? Uh, maybe because of the way I grew up. I don't have, you know, when we went through the high school, there were some Jewish families in the, the town of Heightstown and their fathers had like little clothing stores and, you know, the things that Jewish businessmen had when they were in the minority. Those people were, they were like bent over the, the kids. They were like whipped curs, you know. The Jewish kids from my town, we were all, we were all Jewish. You know, we were kind of proud. We were, uh, we were in the majority, we were in majority types. So I've never felt afraid, but I have been cognizant of what happened in Nazi Germany. And, you know, they had the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan in Heightstown. You know, I've been aware of things that could happen. I think that the younger Jewish people who grow up aren't aware of that anymore. Hence, you have these, uh, I'm not going to say that they're like Stephen Miller, who's a, uh, you know, there's something wrong with him. But, but a lot of Jewish, young Jewish Republicans, you know, they don't understand how long, how recently Jews were not able to get into uh, many institutions. You know, when I was dodging the draft, I took the foreign service exam. That was going to be two years. And I aced it. 
And then I had the uh, the interview and I passed the interview. I didn't get in. I flunked the uh, background check. To some degree, it may have been because I was Jewish. At that time, in the State Department, the Foreign Service, there were virtually no Jews, you know, maybe a handful. Now you see a lot of Jewish ambassadors. You know, the, uh, uh, the White House is sort of like uh, an offshoot of, this, of the Israeli embassy. See, it's uh, ridiculous. It's uh, there's been a whole change of of view, and I just hope that we don't have a wave of anti-Semitism because there are going to be a lot of very shocked people if that happens. I have a Greek friend here uh, who says to me, "I said I haven't seen much anti-Semitism around here." He says, "Yeah, because they don't say it in front of you." He says, there's a huge amount up here. So it's become unfashionable. That's why we don't know about it. You know, ever since the Nazis did one good thing, they made it unfashionable to be an anti-Semite. So uh, the anti-Semites had to go back under the rods. Although Trump has uh, lifted the rods and they are coming out. And uh, when I covered the... Uh, Oklahoma bombing. I went out to Arizona to see the way that uh, McVeigh had lived. He had lived in Kingman, Arizona, which was an isolated area. So right wing, anti, uh, it's like a militia area. The conservation officers for the state conservation department had to wear bulletproof vests because if they ventured out into the hinterland, people would shoot at them. And that's where McVeigh got a lot of his attitudes and I fell in with these people. I was very curious and I learned, you know, there's like the theories that these people have, which for instance, they think that there's an international banking conspiracy that created the federal reserve and that that's the way the United States is controlled. If you listen to uh, uh, Rand Paul and his father talk about the federal reserve, this is what they call dog whistles. When you hear people complaining about the Federal Reserve, you know where they're coming from. Uh, it's, uh, there's, these are the people that have come out from under the rock with uh, Trump. They just know from a public relations point of view that they're not supposed to say anything about Jews, but uh, they do, they, they don't like Jews. And Stephen Miller and his ilk are, a bunch of deluded idiots. They're like useful idiots. <laughs> uh, or useless. For, aren't useless. Yeah. Idiots, right? Let's I mean, keep going. It's, uh, you know, we could just go on for many hours, but let's uh, go through these comments. Rahajan says uh, the first tour of a newspaper was at uh, Newsday's Melville offices in 1979 or 1980. Rajan went on to work at the New York Times for many years. And the mutual love and respect for each other is very evident. Thank you, Rahajan. He's talking about the two of us, uh, yes, which is very true. Which is it's very true. Yeah. Saswati says, uh, really love today's show, Waiting for Better Days. And she's watching from Delhi, India. And Mariana Martinez Estens, you remember oh, her? Yes, glad I to hear her. her this conversation between two great teachers. Love you both. Thank you so Mariana, much. Mariana, how are you? I, I miss you. Oh. I see you on Facebook sometimes. And you look terrific. <laughs> you? Janet, we're all experiencing technical difficulty these days. That sounds about right. Yes. Uh, and uh, Terry Ann Thompson, you remember her? Oh, really? uh, colleague. I think we all started the same year as, as yeah. teachers. What's she doing in Las Vegas? She retired to Las Vegas and uh, she- I hope you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. uh, our friend Neil Parks watching from Springfield, Virginia, and she he's mm -hmm. the he's the executive producer of the New York Times read along. Josh, what do you make of me reading the New York Times print newspaper out loud for five years? You're like Fiorello LaGuardia. You know, you read the comics. That's what I heard. That's what uh, yeah, I heard. Good, about you know? I probably I don't listen to it. I have to apologize. That's but a maybe good. I should because you know, I just look at the times online. The we only get the earliest edition up here, and it comes late in the day. So, so you don't, you don't, you don't get any print publications. No, because we're so isolated here. There's one, the Times Union, which used to be 
a bigger newspaper and it's a Hearst paper in Albany, which is sort of like a uh, shadow of itself. They have very few reporters. They, they don't do very in-depth reporting. It's not their fault, you know, they just, they don't have the resources. Carl uh, Webb says, hello from Austin, Texas. Have you been? Yeah, I love Austin. Very yeah. nice. It's great. Uh, our friend, uh, our former student, Sherpam Sherpa says, Sherpa. Uh, yeah, she says, is happy to hear you both watching from UAE. How nice. What are you doing in the UAE? That's interesting. Well, I follow Sherpa on Facebook and I've seen her. She has two kids, I think. And uh, my own, one of my only regrets about my stay at the J school was I wanted to bring a lot of people from Bhutan as students and Sherpa was sort of a pioneer for me. You know, I don't know if you recall, but we accepted two or three or four people, which from a per capita point of view was- Incredibly really, high, incredibly high. Really, but David Claytel, the late David Claytel, may his soul rest in peace, for some reason thought I was crazy to want to bring people from Bhutan. But I okay. thought this yeah. could be great. You know, they're just emerging into the, the uh, larger world. They've been protected by their rulers. And yeah. we, could, we could have a fantastic impact and, and create a fantastic level of journalism there. It would be, uh, would have been revolutionary. I, yeah, we, I, I believe at one point, four out of the 10 journalists who had, you know, who were English language journalists in Bhutan were trained by Columbia Journalism School. Yeah. So that was they in part been, thanks to you. And uh, I had spent my, from the age of about 10 months to the age of about three years, I spent in Bhutan as a little as a little kid. And uh, Terry says hello to you. And Janice says maintain positivity even though times of challenge. Glad to hear Josh again, says Janice. Thank and you. Mark says would love to hear that about that picture behind Josh. I knew somebody would ask about it. We yeah, talked about yeah. it earlier. Josh. Tell him about that. And I were on vacation in uh, Maine. And I'm going to cut my chin off. You see it? Okay. Yeah, we see it. Uh, we saw this at a, a gallery. The, a fashion photographer, a French fashion photographer, used to go to uh, Brittany to stay at a farm in the summers. And she photographed this family over years. We have another one here. Let me see if I can show you. Can you see that? Yes. That's family taking a uh, lunch while working in the fields. And uh, it just seemed like a uh, fabulous picture. It, just uh, it captured us, my wife and I. We couldn't decide between the two, so we bought both of them. Nice. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is behind you? What is that uh, on that beam behind you? There's like a string oh. or a rope coming down. What is? What is that right it's behind? A, you? a wire from a light. Oh. That, that mask is. I got that in uh, Nepal. Nice. If you look at it closer, it scares the hell out of my granddaughters, unfortunately. But it's supposed to protect the house. Yeah. That's what my daughter was in Nepal in the Peace Corps. Uh, I went to visit her and also for the CPJ. Sky the says, my grandfather used to take corduroy roads up to where you are. Oh, um, wow, Sky must be old. <laughs> uh, Mark says, thanks for doing great audio histories in New York. And North Carolina Folklore Association does similar work. Uh, Rose says, so great to hear Josh Friedman and his perspective of Sri as a student. Uh, mm -hmm. And my, my dad, who's watching from uh, Kerala, says, your guest looks like Field Marshal Manikshaw. This is one of India's greatest battlefield heroes. Uh, really? he was the, yes, so he that's says, like, yeah, that's a compliment. I left my, uh, my stick. What are those sticks that they carry? Yes, that's right. Those baton type things, yes. Uh, <laughs> Mark says, Josh, did you ever meet George Reedy, one of my professors from Marquette, who was LBJ's press secretary? No, I remember George Reedy as a press secretary. He was very down home, kind of a relaxed guy who uh, had a tough job because Johnson used to uh, say things that had to be rescued. And I also remember he had bad feet. That became a huge news story. Uh, Terry um, says, wasn't our Dean Tom Goldstein also class of 68? No, Tom was in a class I think of 67, right. although I became friends with Tom well before I went to Columbia. We were, uh, when he was working for uh, Ed Koch. 
And uh, talk about the Pulitzer Prize you won. Rose is pointing out, our producer is pointing out that you won for international reporting. Well, it wasn't, it was a team in a sense, but I, I want, I just have to say that each of us was listed individually. So I feel that's why I can say I won that Pulitzer because some people who are a group, you know, they were in a group. I know this sounds sort of self-centered, but some people win. You're I saying that as you're trying to center yourself in the frame. So self-centering oh. is the king. What am I supposed to do here? Yeah, let's get right there, right there. If they win a group thing, sometimes a whole newspaper wins it. That's right. And then they say, well, I want to pull it. But I'm going to be very vain and tell you that they had our, name, our names are listed. So there were three of us. I went with a wonderful photographer named Ozir Muhammad. Yes. Do you may know. Do you know him, Sri? Yes, very well. Yeah. Went to the Times. Ozir came from what could be considered sort of aristocracy. His grandfather was Elijah Muhammad. Wow. And I remember a scene in Mali when we were, we had gone to Africa. We were sent, as I said, the paper had a lot of money. They sent us to cover desertification in the Sahel region of Africa, a story no one was going to read. I mean, the, uh, Ozier was listed before Dennis. I don't know why they listed it that way. The, uh, but they, you know, they had all these, the publisher would have like these vanity projects. Like everything in journalism, it just turned out to be a very lucky break, a morbidly lucky break, that we arrived in the Sahel region of Africa, which goes from uh, West Africa over toward Ethiopia. And the year that they had that horrible famine. So what was an obscure story turned into a uh, the world story. It was like, you know, people from all over the world. And since we had prepared, I did a huge amount of research. And I went over to the UN and got a lot of letters of introduction. And Ethiopia was a very closed society then. It was run by a Stalinist type government, the Derg. And they weren't letting anyone in because they were keeping the famine a secret. But when we were there in uh, Ivory Coast or Mali, uh, the f secret came out. And suddenly they were welcoming journalists. But uh, we were the first journalists, first newspaper journalists to go there because it took the during Stalinist government was such a bureaucratic nightmare. It took weeks, if not months, to uh, get press credentials, press permits. So we got there and no one else was there. And uh, since Newsday had so much money, I rented a DC-3 without even checking back at the newspaper, which created a certain amount of concern later on. <laughs> and uh, we just worked, I mean, we, uh, knocked it out of the park. It was, uh, you have to be lucky to win one of these policies. You know, there are a lot of very good reporters, but then when, then when uh, the opportunity presents itself, you have to really work hard. So all of the elements were present and it worked out. It was, uh, it was a uh, stunning experience and I didn't realize till later on when I was at the J school and I sat on a few, uh, uh, I guess they're called juries, I forget. Yep. Well, it's a juries, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how extraordinary the the uh, uh, the consideration is of the entries. It made me feel better. You know, at the time we got it, I thought, ah, maybe Gene Robert, uh, uh, Dave Laventhal, who was the publisher, had, had, you know, pulled it, made a deal. Or but no, it was uh, it was on the merits. I feel very good about it. It was uh, all of my experience as a journalist came into play. It was it was like uh, being one of these uh, first responders with the COVID. I mean, you're there and you just have to do it. And and, and we want to remind people that this was in the this was in the mid '80s, uh, and it looks like you beat out the New York Times team that covered. The assassination of Indira Gandhi. So that was another big story. And typically, 
uh, the Pulitzers and other prizes uh, focus on kind of breaking news kind of stories. So the fact that you were yeah. able to put them on that big a story was was fascinating. I want to ask you a. Uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, a lot of the credit goes to Ozir because what we did was we matched the content of the writing with the pictures. Like if I would find someone interesting that I was speaking to in a camp or whatever, I would say, oh, Zier, you know, this is the person I spoke to and I said such and such, and he would come over and photograph that person. Or if he said, I just photographed a really interesting person, come on over, I would go and interview the person. So I think what was happening was in newspapers at that point, you know, pre, uh, pre web, the photographers and the writers didn't cooperate very much. It was sort of uh, uh, disorienting because you would be reading about someone in the story and pictures would be of someone else. It was kind of uh, confusing. You know, people were watching TV. They were used to seeing the person they were learning about saying, talking. So by harmonizing it, I think it created a uh, kind of a subliminal or nuanced uh, theme or, or feeling for the people who read it and saw it. And uh, it worked. I was very happy with it. Although I got sick in Ethiopia, I was here took me to the hospital in Nairobi. And uh, uh, they made me go back <laughs> to get out of the hospital. And uh, it was great. I have a very affectionate feeling for Ethiopia. I just want to point out that uh, Ethiopia is not the only country where you've spent time. There is in the country of Georgia, there's a Joshua Friedman Prize. And yes. uh, I, my, my uh, Georgian is a little rusty, but so, I was able to find this. This is interesting, right? Georgia is a, uh, it's like an island in a sea of of kind of strange countries, you know, to the north are the Caucasus, the uh, Chechnya type countries, and uh, uh, Armenia is next to it. Armenia has got a lot of problems. Azerbaijan is one of the most hostile to journalists in the world. Iran is to the south. Uh, Turkey, another very anti journalist atmosphere. For some reason, and I'll tell you the reason. There are two reasons. The underlying reason is that the Georgians are actually a very civilized group of people. They're uh, Christians in a sea of Muslims to a great degree. They feel, uh, they've always felt kind of special, like the Ethiopians. Uh, they grew up in valleys, there are many tribes, many uh, dialects, and they feel special about themselves. And they, I think they respect education. The other thing is, a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School, Margie, I can't remember her last name, went to Georgia years before I went there as part of the International Federation of, uh, it's a night sponsored thing, IFCJ, I think it's called, IFG says, it's in Washington. It's like a Peace Corps for journalists. She spent a year and she helped start a journalism school modeled on the Columbia Journalism School which as most of the people listening know is pretty unique in its hands-on approach versus theoretical stuff. And um, through a set of circumstances, I was invited to go there to Chipa, it's called, and give some talks and so on. And we fell in love with each other. And uh, they named the prize after me, which was a shocker. Usually you have to put up money to have it prize they have to you, but they put up the money in the Dutch foreign ministry and uh, European Journalism Center. And I go there every year. I obviously can't go there this year. And it's had a, interestingly, had a very encouraging impact. You know, if you give these prizes, it's like the impact that Pulitzer has. It's really elevated the level of investigative journalism and people are proud to get a prize. So I feel very good about it. The, the journalism there is pretty good. Let's uh, let's go quickly through some of these questions. Lots of so many questions and comments here. Uh, 
Uh, did Josh did Friedman grow up in New Jersey in farm country? And what yeah. kind of commune were you in? It was a cooperative. It's now called Roosevelt, New Jersey, named after FDR. We started in the 30s by uh, Albert Einstein and Eleanor Roosevelt, and a guy named Benjamin Brown, a visionary Jewish European immigrant who set up co-ops out west and decided finally he would work with his own people. They got money from the uh, federal government under the New Deal. It was money that was used to sort green belt communities and money for farm communities and so on. The idea was to have a uh, farm, various farms, dairy, poultry, vegetables, a uh, factory, because most of the people coming were immigrant Jews who were working in the garment industry in New York or Philadelphia. And the store was called the commissary and uh, everybody helped build their houses. They were designed in the Bauhaus style. The, the assistant architect was Louis Kahn who later went on to be very famous. And um, it was an idyllic place to grow up. Unfortunately, the co-op failed after a few years because the people couldn't agree on things, which is common in co-ops. But it, the spirit lived on and a lot of artists and writers came there. My father was brought there because he had studied agriculture at Cornell and he was supposed to be helping them with the farms when he graduated. But the thing went out of business, the, that part. So he wound up working for the town a little bit and then he started commuting to New York. But uh, I grew up with a very varied group of people that were every political stripe, the, Marxists, Stalinists, Trotskyists, socialists, they all hated each other. <laughs> My parents were considered right-wingers because they were Truman Democrats. <laughs> and they supported Adlai Stevenson. They ran the Stevenson campaign. That was very right-wing. <laughs> I don't think there was a Republican in the town. But uh, it was wonderful. We hung out in the woods. It was a lovely way to grow up, just a group my cohort was about 20 people. And uh, that, it was small, you know, the school was small. And uh, we just grew up hanging around in nature. And uh, each house had a big yard with gardens and stuff. I loved it. And and I have, the places I have loved living in my life have been little villages. One in the Peace Corps, up in the mountains in Costa Rica, in a very remote area. Now this Rensselaerville, which is in the hills, uh, the foothills of the Catskills, overlooking the Hudson Valley. There's something about a village that brings out uh, both positive things in people and also very petty negative things. But in a village, you know everybody and everybody knows you and you're connected. Why do you think, uh, uh, Feroz asks, why do you think even educated people get trapped into politicians' BS and get divided based on religion, race, etc.? Because we're tribal. You know, basically we're tribal people. And, you know, especially in the United States where the immigrants came from tribal areas. Look, you know, the Sicilians came. Very tribal area. The... Uh, the Jews from Eastern Europe, tribal, down to the little village, you know, and the same with the Italian immigrants, you know, they would have the, uh, we learned this history when we took the uh, international students on a tour of the Lower East Side in Little Italy, which hardly exists anymore. The people used to live on a certain street, depending on whether they were from Naples or from Genoa or from Sicily. They, they divide it up that way. And the nature of tribal living is that you distrust the other. The other is the enemy. So even though many of us, you know, we're third or fourth generation or more, I think, you know, some of this stuff stuck with us. And, uh, you know, if we're tickled in the right way and made to feel insecure enough, we revert sometimes. And uh, that's what happens. Trump is very good at, at uh, making people feel frightened. 
you know, the enemy is on the doorstep. And uh, he's played it very cleverly until the divine intervention of the COVID-19. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, Mark says, I could listen to these stories all night long. Great stories he is sharing. But I don't think we want to be here all night long. Uh, <laughs> what time do you go to bed? What time do you go to bed? Why don't you get me started? I don't shut up. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Eileen says, so good to see Josh Friedman here. And oh, my Eileen, hi. Yeah. Eileen, I love Eileen. Yeah, Eileen there. is a phenomenal foreign correspondent who lives in Florida now. And I, met, I saw her, and she was one of the students I really loved my first year there. And I saw her in Jerusalem when she lived there. She showed me all around her, uh, her uh, shtetl. <laughs> I went to a uh, Shabbos dinner, Sabbath dinner with her at her friend's house. And it was very Hamish, which is, you know, like uh, these are Yiddish words that I picked up from my grandparents. Hamish means kind of home, home like. Home, you know? home like. Mark says, I've been reading Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Some of these same lessons are being taught by the government even back then. Oh, the way we treated the Indians, uh, Native Americans. It's just, you know, I watched Stagecoach. I, one of the guys on our advisory board, Sam Pollard, the Logan board, said he thought the best movie ever made was Stagecoach. Sam, Sam is an African-American. He said, there are some things in there that are going to bother you. It was made by John Ford. It was John Wayne's first uh, feature film, basically, as a young actor. And it's a fantastically made film. But of course, they're shooting the hell out of the Indians. You know, it's on John Wayne with one rifle. Presumably, he has a clip of, I don't know, six or a dozen cartridges. He's shooting like three dozen Indians, and they're falling off their horses. It's, uh, it's terrible, the way they're portrayed. And this but, is that movie that you mentioned. What do you think of what's happening with uh, the removal of John Wayne's name from things. There's a big movement to continue that in California. They're doing that. And where are you on? Uh, you may have seen there's a petition that's been written uh, asking to remove Thomas Jefferson's statue by yeah. alumni. Uh, alumni at Columbia Journalism School have asked for that statue to be brought, taken down. Well, you know, I'm an older person and I don't feel that comfortable with a lot of this stuff. You know, I don't know who the hell it is that they tore down Frederick Douglass's statue in Rochester. And uh, some abolitionists out in San Francisco. I don't know who starts these things. I could see the Confederates. It's disgusting that they have those Confederate statues. And that, that stuff was all done in the late 19th century and early 20th century when the Klan was really uh, uh, suppressing black people. And, you know, it was horrible. Jim Crow and all that. Those things all should go. But uh, I don't see, I don't know, Jim J Jefferson, I, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that. It's, uh, you know, I can understand Black people feeling very uncomfortable with Confederate statues. It's the way I would feel if I saw a statue of some Nazi guy, or, you know, or an, a raving anti-Semite, you know. I, I would want them all gone. But uh, at some point, there has to be a, a temperance of it. I mean, I, you know, maybe I sound like an old fogey. I don't know. But, uh, you know, Jefferson did some good things, too. He wrote the Constitution. <laughs> the Constitution is a good document. For those who haven't read it, they should read it. You know, he had many defects, and one of which was this, having slaves and raping slave, female slaves, and children, young, you know, underage female slaves. Uh, I think it has to, the statue thing has to be done in a more institutional way than having crowds tear them down. I mean, I think that if Trump were any kind of a sentient being, there would be a movement to establish an institutional method of 
making judgments. Uh, then it would be done in a civilized way. And if they remove all the statues, so be it, you know. It would be having, it would have been done in a, it would be like in India if they put out statues of Muslims. I mean, you know, that I could. You mean that the Mughal emperors, uh, you, you're, you're talking about that? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, you have to have, it has to be done in the right way. You can't just have a, I don't want to use the word mob because Trump uses it. And I don't know who the instigators are of some ways. You know, the Russians are very eager to get everyone all screwed up. And, and so is Trump. The boogaloo, you know, the Justice Department keeps talking about Antifa, but if you look at the people that they've arrested, most of them are either nutty people or belong to the boogaloo movement, which is, uh, you know, fanatic right-wing racist uh, white supremacy group. So I just wish it were being done in a more organized way so that, uh, you know, I'd like to see Gates and black intellectuals that I respect who are familiar with history be put in a position where they could make judgments rather than just some people throw a rope on a statue. And you were talking about Henry Louis Gates, uh, also known as Skip Gates, a uh, yeah. famous Harvard professor, who in one of the more surreal moments of the Obama presidency, was involved in a situation where somebody called the cops because yeah. he was locked out of his own home. He was trying to get into his house. And fortunately, this was in Cambridge, I gather, and so there yeah. were no bullets fired or he was not shot or anything. But yeah. he ended up, he and that police officer ended up having beer at the White House I'm with Obama. Sure. Obama. And yeah. that was a lifetime ago. Yeah. And, uh, here we are uh, today uh, with everything that's happening. Uh, Josh, we've got to stop now. It's already 11 o'clock. We started it. Oh, my God. Gee, don't you have any discipline? <laughs> what about all that stuff I taught you? <laughs> we've been going for two hours. <laughs> That's because you took a saunter away from the studio for, like, I don't know for how long you decided to walk away. It happened to me. <laughs> or Trump, it happened to me. It was it was the Trump administration cutting you out. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So on a on a serious note, let's uh, we got to let you go. And uh, by the way, Rusudan says I met you in two thousand nine. Hello, Mr. Friedman. Rusudan, yes, how are you? Nice to see you again. Yeah. Uh, so here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to talk to young journalists. Do you still recommend journalism as a career? Uh, what are what are the things that you've learned in your life as a journalist that you think are still relevant, still matter in today's world? And then we will stop and okay. let you go. It's hard to, you know, the thing is about journalism, uh, it's an affliction. It's like an addiction. And uh, you can't, people who decide to be journalists really, uh, you can't just decide to be a journalist. It's something that's sort of inside of you and you can't help it. So unfortunately now the market model is collapsed. So if you become a journalist now, you're not gonna, you're gonna have trouble supporting a family. And uh, I would not urge anyone to do that without really thinking it out uh, thoroughly. I think it has to be that in the long run, there will be a, something will develop that will allow serious journalists to live, uh, to support themselves as journalists. I don't know whether, you know, it could be what happened with radio where you have subscription models on FM. It could be uh, uh, narrow casting of FM stations, like, uh, you know, that aim for just certain audiences. Uh, Obviously, the consumers will have to put up money in some way. Uh, the advertising model isn't working. Uh, if you have the affliction, I can't tell you not to do it because you have the affliction. <laughs> but, and it's really scary now that there aren't as many journalists as there used to be. And uh, the democracy needs it. So you'd be doing, uh, you'd be like in a, a first responder to do it, but it's going to be very hard, very, very rough compared to the 
easy life I had uh, working for well-funded institutions. That's my advice. Take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Let's look at some of these comments. Sherpin says, this is great. Jonathan says, wonderful stories, great rock contour. Thank you. And Rose says, this is almost as long as our 100th edition that went for two and a half hours. <laughs> and Sherpin said she enjoyed the international class. And Roberta Oster is watching from uh, Richmond, Virginia. And uh, Josh, I just want to say on the record in front of everybody, thank you for uh, 25 years of teaching me so many different things and from being an awesome colleague, first awesome teacher, awesome colleague, and uh, somebody who inspired so many people uh, around the world. And I saw that firsthand what you did for so many people, including me, and I'll never forget. And I'm using this pandemic as a chance to just uh, check in with my friends and my mentors. And that's what I'm doing here. And I'm just super grateful to you uh, for giving us two hours. I know you didn't mean to give us two hours, but you did. Hey, look, my calendar's not that full these days. Where am I going to go? <laughs> anyway, Shri, I'm very proud of you too. I, I mean, really proud that you've done so well. And keep it up, man. We need you. Thank you. And our friends, our, our guest has been Josh Friedman. We're going to let it go. And then we're going to do a couple of uh, housekeeping things, including telling you about an awesome show we have tomorrow at noon uh, that you won't want to miss. So let's let Josh go. And thank you, Josh. Good night. Thank you, Shri. Good night to all my friends who sent messages. I think about you often. Thanks. And Josh is amazing. But uh, I want to tell you about our show tomorrow. And then we also want to uh, do what we do every night, which is to say their names. And um, I'm going to show you here our show for tomorrow. I meet I Fund Women. Karen Kahan will be with us. She's the CEO and founder of I Fund Women, a marketplace for women-owned businesses and the people who want to fund them. This is part of our continuing conversation, episode 124. That means episode 125 in 125 days is on Tuesday at 9 p.m., how will we celebrate it? What will we do? What should we do? You tell us. Email me, please. Sri at Sri.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E.net. I want your ideas on how we should mark episode 125. It's hard to even imagine that we have been doing this and doing it nonstop without a break for four plus months now. I have been, one of the things that we did do on the show after talking to Kimberly Crenshaw, the a uh, Columbia professor who coined the term intersectionality is to say her name and to say their name. She told us to do that. So we've been saying their names in different ways. Uh, we, for several weeks, we were saying their names by reading the names from a Time Magazine cover where they listed names of uh, people who had been killed. And uh, if you haven't seen this photograph before, on the left is a cover of Time Magazine by Titus Kaffer and on the right is a picture of a young George Floyd with his mother, Larcinia Floyd. Larcinia would, be, would die two years almost to the day before her son George would be killed. And they're buried now together in Houston. He died in Minneapolis, as you know. But over the last few days, we also decided to do something a little different, inspired by Kimberly Crenshaw and her suggestion that we say her name. And I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna read the names from the Wikipedia report uh, of Say Her Name, the Say Her Name report. And I'm gonna say these names. And we do this every single day as we try to make sense of what is happening around this country. Brianna Taylor, Tatiana Jefferson, Charlena Siobhan Lyles, Corin Gaines, India Kager, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Michelle Cousseau, Mer Pearlie Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith, Renisha McBride, Miriam Carey, Kaim Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelley Frey, Melissa Williams, 
Shalina Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantelle Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Sharice Francis, Ayana Stanley Jones, Tarika Wilson, Katherine Johnston, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, and Eleanor Bumpers. Such a hard thing to imagine all those people. Each one is a story. Each one is a name worth saying and a word name worth remembering. If you have suggestions for guests on the show, people we should talk to, we would be very grateful if you would write to me at sri at sri.net, S-R-E-E at S-R-E-E dot net. We are always looking for ideas, theme suggestions, topics to cover. And as you've heard, we've had um, more than 70, 75. We've had now 125 shows tomorrow. And in our first 100 shows, we had 201 guests. 45 cities and 12 countries were represented in those guests. And we've had more than a million viewers of our shows cumulatively. And we want to continue to do this. Please tell us your suggestions by emailing me, sri at sri.net. We want to thank our sponsors for making it possible to be with here, here with you every single day. We want to thank Muckrack Academy for the free Fundamentals of Social Media course, free certification in Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And you just sign up at mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have already signed up. And we want to remind you that this Thursday, we're hosting Dr. Little Stevens Roadshow. Join Stevie Van Zant and guests in a dynamic exchange to support Teach Rock's free curriculum, teachrock.org slash roadshow. Guests include Kanya Das, Kid Leo, Michael Stanley, and Neil Giraldo. You've got to join us. It'll be awesome. Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, teachrock.org slash roadshow. It's one of the many shows that my team at DigiMentors puts together and does for the world, all around the world. If you'd like a show that or a virtual event that you need to put on the air, please talk to us and we will help you. We keep saying, don't postpone that conference. Don't cancel it. Don't even plan it without talking to me first and my incredible team, Sri at Sri.net. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow for the episode on I Fund Women, which is at noon Eastern, a different time, noon Eastern tomorrow. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye.